This is 2OF Entertainment. Hi, it's Kiffin Lebates here, and today's video is a look at the woes of OpenSea. So, just a couple of years ago, OpenSea was a couple of guys in a garage thinking up and implementing a, an NFT marketplace, which has gone on to become the most successful non-fungible token marketplace out there. And recently, they actually raised 300 million in funding valuing OpenSea at about $14 billion. So not bad going from an entrepreneurship point of view. Unfortunately, with success come troubles and OpenSea have had quite a lot of them over the last year. And what I want to look at today is their listing and marketplace contract and the problems they've experienced with that. They had a bunch of problems back in early November with a uh, particular NFT collection called CryptoFunks, which are flipped CryptoPunks and therefore a copy of the original NFT collection, the CryptoPunks, which have made the headlines in the news over the last year due to the staggering prices that are being paid in order to buy these little pixelated heads. And what happened with the CryptoFunks and what has happened recently to OpenSea again uh, is related to this listing contract. And it gives me a great opportunity to talk about some of the features of tokens on the Ethereum blockchain and also some of the pitfalls that can snag you and that have snagged OpenSea. So for a bit of background on the CryptoFunks, because it gives us an explanation as to what's gone wrong this month, uh, what happened there was that OpenSea delisted that particular co uh, collection on the grounds of copyright infringement and stopped displaying those tokens on their site, which I guess is a sensible thing to do. Copyright infringement is not something that I approve of, but it is something that happens regularly in the uh, NFT world. And the thing that OpenSea overlooked was the fact that there were some people who had bought CryptoFunks and had listed them for sale using OpenSea's automatic um, marketplace contract. So what this relies on is the fact that for ERC-20 tokens and ERC-721s and ERC-1155s, all different kinds of tokens, the standard has something called approving another address to operate your tokens for you. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you trust somebody else or if you trust a contract, you can give that person or that contract the right to move your tokens around for you. So rather than you deciding to transfer your token to another address, you can say to another address, I'll allow you to take it if you want to. And obviously, if you're going to give a contract or a person that permission, you have to trust them. So, for example, if I trust you, I could give you approval to uh, take one of my NFTs. And we might do that, for example, if it's a utility NFT in a game that allows you to have a superpower, then when I'm asleep, you can transfer the token out of my wallet into yours, play the game, and at the end of your playing, uh, you transfer the token back to me, and when I wake up, I can then use it in the game. So it's a way of sharing stuff, for example, in that case. Uh, in the case of smart contracts, you approve a smart contract to operate your token or move your token around on your behalf and you trust that contract because you can look at the code and see under what circumstances it will take the token off you. And that's why um, approvals are used by marketplace uh, contracts because if you wanted to sell an NFT, you could transfer it to a marketplace contract and it would then be owned by that contract and you could list it for a price and then somebody else might come along and see that the contract allows them to deposit a certain amount of ether into the contract and take the 
on receive the NFT in return. And that means that the marketplace contract is acting as a sort of intermediary in a way. And this is how OpenSea's market contract kind of works, but rather than you having to give it the NFT, you give the contract approval to move the token on your behalf. And the contract will only move the token on receipt of the payment that you've asked for. That's what a marketplace listing is. Now, what happened to the crypto funks is that some people had listed their tokens for sale in the marketplace contract. Then OpenSea pulled the display of the collection from their website. And the people who owned crypto funks could no longer see them on OpenSea and had to go to other marketplaces in order to view their tokens. And some of them forgot that they'd listed their tokens at a certain price in Ether. And the marketplace should have a timeout on it, and I think OpenSeas does, like you can list it for a month or six months or something like that. But what happened was, in the me uh, meantime, the price of the tokens went up on the open market, and then somebody discovered that a lot of tokens were still listed on OpenSeas marketplace contract at the low price. So the people who listed them had forgotten that they'd done so because they could no longer see them on OpenSea and they went to other sites and there was no reminder that their token is still listed on a contract operated by OpenSea. And people came in and started buying these tokens cheaply and then selling them on for a, an Im immediate profit. So that caused a bit of a panic and a scramble. Um, the current problem we're seeing is that people were listing perfectly valid tokens that are still shown on the OpenSea site on the marketplace, then deciding they wanted to delist them and noticing that the gas fees for delisting a token uh, were higher than the cost of just transferring your token out of one address and into another one. And so they were taking that cheaper option. And this makes financial sense because uh, why pay an excessive gas fee to delist your token when you can just move the token to a second address that you own and now that marketplace contract can no longer move the token because it's not in the address that gave approval for that token to be moved around. It's a cheaper way of avoiding um, having that marketplace contract take the NFT off you if it's bought by somebody. And on the surface, this sounds like a sensible approach. You save some gas and the net effect is that your token is sort of delisted because it can't be uh, taken by the marketplace contract anymore. Except there's a problem. And the problem is this. If you move your token back to that first address at a later point, then the listing becomes valid again. And so if you list a token that you're holding in address A at say one ether, and then a month later you decide you don't want to sell it anymore, so you move it to address B, and then the price of these tokens goes up from one ether to say 10 ether, and then you forget that you've listed your token if it's in address A um, on the marketplace, and you move your token back from address B to address A, now that listing of one ETH becomes valid again, and somebody can come along and say, hey, the floor price for these tokens is 10 Ether, and somebody's listed one of them on the OpenSea marketplace contract for one ETH. What are you gonna do? You're gonna buy it for one ETH, immediately sell it for 10 ETH, and make nine ETH profit. That's a very, very easy way to make a living. Of course, on the downside, the people who owned the tokens in the first place and forgot about the listings wake up and find that their token is gone and they've received a fraction of what they thought the value of the token was. So that is going to make people unhappy. Now, the problem, unfortunately, was further compounded by OpenSea, according to reports that I read on Twitter, which is that when OpenSea found out that this was happening and that they had made a mistake in not alerting people that their listings were still active, they sent out emails to all the people who still had these active listings. And they told them, you need to delist your token immediately, which on the surface of it sounds a sensible thing to do. If you've got a token listed in the OpenSea Marketplace contract for one ETH and the floor price is now 10 ETH, you should de delist it as soon as possible, shouldn't you? Well, yes and no. You see, 
it's hard to search the blockchain for relevant information that lets you know that some tokens are listed on some contract at a ridiculously low price. And so the snipers sitting out there looking to make a quick buck had a big job ahead of them to try and find out where all these tokens listed at low prices were hiding. And when OpenSea told people to go and submit transactions to the marketplace contract to delist the uh, tokens that they had, well, that was like an alert to these snipers that these tokens were available. And as a result, we saw something called front running. There are now apparently bots out there that are monitoring the OpenSea marketplace contract to see if people are sending delist my token um, transactions to the contract. And when they spot one of these, they front run it. They submit a transaction that says, I want to buy that token and they provide enough gas to that transaction to ensure that their transaction is executed before the transaction that tries to cancel the listing. And as a result, unfortunately, what happened is that OpenSea gave advice to people to do something that alerted snipers to the very fact that there was an opportunity to make some money. And some people tried to delist their tokens and instead found that their tokens were snaffled out from under their noses just before their transaction to delist them actually happened. So it's kind of sad that all this stuff is happening to people who are relying on a company like OpenSea to look after their interests. Um, I watch with interest what OpenSea is going to do to try and compensate them. At least they have enough money in the bank now to do something about redressing the mistake that they've made. But above all, it's a salutary lesson in how complicated these systems are and how the implications and ramifications of design decisions that are made both in the smart contract side of things and in the web side of things can have a serious effect on the wealth and presumably therefore the mental well-being of the customers that are using the service. It's a, it's a sad tale. I do hope that OpenSea manages to get their act together and they spend some of the money that they have received in funding on actually auditing, investigating and securing their platform. Because if they don't, I can't see this ending very, very well. Anyway, that's today's video on the woes and trials and tribulations of OpenSea. I hope you found it interesting and I'll see you in the next video soon. Bye for now.